I am going to offer, you know, some kind of reflections on practice that, um, uh, uh, let's see, that are, <laughs> how do I want to put it? That they're, they're um, well, coming right out of all the experience I've had, really, in my um, my life as a meditator and as a human being and uh, you know broadly speaking what I'd call my spiritual life you know I want to make some sort of overall points about this practice related to that kind of thing in this talk and I'm, I'm going to take a little bit of a risk I think because I want to speak to um, another side of practice than perhaps what most of us most of the time focus on, myself included. Um, some of you who, you know, who've heard me um, talk to this Sangha before, which, I, you know, which I've done a, two or three times, I think. Um, and I, I remember using a metaphor that comes out of the Zen tradition, the, or Chan tradition, you know, early Chinese Buddhism, basically. From the sixth century, early sixth century, there was a there was a a, a, a view of practice that said um, practice is a is a cart track with two ruts, two wheel ruts. One rut is the four foundations of mindfulness, and uh, <clears throat> you know, broadly speaking, we could just call that mindfulness developing more presence, more awareness, more capacity to stay centered, to be grounded, to uh, know what's going on within us and outside of us with greater equanimity, being more responsive, less reactive, having some more control of the sort of levers on our nervous system, um, and more besides. For many of us, that might be the whole of practice, actually. But this teaching says there's a second rut to the cart track. And that second rut, it calls principle. And now that's a slightly weird word. And, but what it refers to is <clears throat> um, sometimes in the same Chinese Buddhist tradition is also called the way with a capital W, <laughs> sometimes the great way, you know, and the way is linked up with um, this term awakening. It refers to um, what can happen to us both through practice and not through practice, where, whereby we sort of suddenly, and it usually is some kind of sudden shift. It can be very gentle, but it's still a distinct shift from one moment to the next. When, when you know, there are various characteristics of it, but essentially when instead of feeling like a separate human being making their way somehow through this world during their life. Instead of feeling like that, we feel suddenly part of something greater, a great wholeness, we might, we might say. And again, even that too can show itself in slightly different ways, but we sort of feel a, a different kind of belonging um, in which we're not, somehow we're not separate from, well, it can feel like the whole of creation. Somehow, yeah, we, we, we're still sort of who we are, but we've discovered, it, this is what it feels like, like we've discovered a level of existence where we're not separate, where you know perhaps nothing is separate, 
there's a wholeness in which all is participating and you know it's that that that's an idea perhaps that many of us would would subscribe to anyway but when we touch this second rut of the cart track principle or the way it, it it's it's a visceral personal experience of it we really it's really sort of somehow a discovery about a side of our own existence that we hadn't known before now i bring it up as a risk i, I think it is a risk it has various risks attached to it uh first of all um there's the risk that um any of us might might hear that and just you know for whatever reasons just not not want to hear about it we don't believe it we think it's sort of nonsense or something that's okay that's that's a risk we take but more more concerning in a, in some sense is the risk that we might feel that that's something we should experience and that if we don't we're lacking in some way and and that is the biggest risk because um um we're not at all you know it's it's really um um probable that many of us have had actually have had glimpses of what i'm talking about and may not really have noticed because uh, you know unless we're you know somehow sort of a uh, attuned to it or open to it we, we might just kind of have a little hit of that and, and just sort of it slides off and you know we come back to our life and in its normal sense and we just sort of disregard it and and it doesn't seem either important or um you know it doesn't really impress itself on us but actually maybe was there and um it's also not something that um you know that we can really sort of do much about if you sort of mean like yes we can practice and but if we practice in the hope of having that kind of experience of that brand of awakening well that's that's no good because practice isn't about trying to get something that's not already present practice is always about sort of resting more in what is here already and tending to it as needed when tending and care is needed and sort of maybe exploring when that's appropriate exploring you know the realm the the the, the realms of consciousness or the realm the, the what experience is in different ways you know um but it's not practice is it's never about sort of something other than what is already here so um please um um forgive me if i have um if i'm bringing up something that is uncomfortable and that you know sort of and giving any impression that there's something sort of to be attained that we aren't already attaining or something like that but here's why i do want to on the other hand do want to bring it up is is that well first of all you know it is it is an old teaching um in buddhism too you know it's often the practice is sometimes called the royal road to awakening and it's sort of identifying something called awakening as as a possibility um that is something to do with practice and that presumably you know um if it's a royal road to it means it's it's sort of a, a remote destination it's all a bit tricky because um it isn't practice is never about anything other than what is here now as i was saying and that's even true of this awakening matter 
this second rut of the cart track is is always with us actually and so in that sense also um, we don't need to be looking for it at all it's always here we're always in fact part of a greater whole and even little tastes of that greater belonging um, can be so nourishing and 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 yes we'll all have them and so so again bringing up this strand of practice just raising it a little bit from the ground is is i think it's okay it just alerts us to this possibility of catching glimpses of you know a wider belonging you know that's that's really how we might put it now and the other reason why i want to i do want to talk to it is that you know well you know it's also it is real it is real that we you know people do um suddenly find this um some shades of this this kind of um rem well, sort of remarkable um shift in sense of being human people do find it and um i feel um personally that i i i i, I have some kind of I don't know some sort of uh, sense that I I I I I need to talk to it because I myself was struck by it you know and in early life, and I want to, and I want to sort of dis, want to sort of acknowledge that and and um, speak to it and and sort of um, appreciate it you know and share share uh, encouragement to all of us that. We, 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 this is how things are. We are at the same time as being separate beings navigating life the best we can with lots of knocks and lots of difficulties and lots of heartache and also, you know, successes and triumphs and things that go well and pleasures and joys and all of it. At the same time, all of us are also um, part of this greater wholeness and can sometimes glimpse in a very immediate uh, sort of a convincing way that that really is so. And so, um, yeah, let me, um, let me just speak a little bit personally about how these two cart ruts of the single cart track sort of operate. Just, just for a moment, I'll just talk to that a little bit autobiographically that you know when i was um 19 years old i i, I had a sudden moment of, of this discovery of, of being part of a greater whole you know and it was it was absolutely beautiful and mind-blowing and and I, of course i didn't practice i had no um i started practicing five years after that actually and uh, meditating and um and I, I had no idea really what what it was i didn't have a frame of reference for it but it it happened and i and i knew that it was real that really I, I suddenly my ordinary sense of being separate which i didn't even particularly notice i had until it was gone you know but but there was this sudden sense of being part of a of a of a of, a, of an infinite kind of spaciousness except it had no space it was really everything immediately present everything intimately present and no distance and no time and the furthest reaches of time were right here and it was very 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 beautiful and um and and it and it, it was it was you know it left me in a really different place uh, uh, for several days and then even several weeks and um but but after it i and this is where something i really want to sort of emphasize that even if we you know 
do touch that dimension of our existence and we can you know and um but it's it's actually it seems like a it can seem like a sort of answer to everything and in, and in some ways it, it sort of is really but I mean, what happened to me was that I, I was actually away from home at the time. I'd been working and backpacking, traveling far from home. And I came, I went back home after it um, and, um, and went right into, you know, back home into the life that I'd, I'd grown up in, which was, um, had there's a level of chronic stress in it that um, I'd, skillfully suppressed and really suppressed and not dealt with living you know, basically with a, in a level of sort of post-traumatic response much of my childhood you know and and um and i came home having been sort of opened up by this marvelous discovery you know and i was um absolutely floored by the all the unfelt emotion of my childhood just overwhelmed me and I had something like a sort of minor nervous breakdown and it took and then I kind of managed to sort of struggle through college and and then began to work I was very 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 unhappy through all of it until I started meditating and you know the point that I, I don't need to go into all of that too much but the point I want to make is that um, I think there's a real wisdom in this double track that there's two sides to practice because you know in, in my own case even having sort of had a, a little brush with that second rut of the track i just totally needed nothing but the first rut for years i just needed to gradually develop more mindfulness that would give me more capacity to 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 tend to my you know that my woundedness and my and not just my woundedness but my my def the carapace of defensiveness that i developed to deal with my chronic stress and and post traumatic condition and highly um you know tense and and a lot of anxiety and very, very sort of closed down and i had to do a lot of therapy as well and and I mean, I've, it's not like I feel I'm totally through it even now. You know, if I, if difficult things happen that give me a setback, I'm gonna I'm gonna go to therapy. I'm gonna go to whatever I need. And and I'm I'm really sort of happy to have felt that over the course of three and a half decades now of practice, somehow um, sometimes I've been sort of more cognizant of the second rut, but never losing track of the first rut and it seems to me that there's a way of um because I'm, I'm like i'm saying imagine many of you may, may have had glimpses of this you know the sort of wider sense of who we are and what we are and the wonder of of being part of this cosmos not and really viscerally part of it not just uh not just um not just sort of as an idea, but uh, really, really, we can really see, see it and know it, know it in our bones. I am part of this whole universe, you know, and, and I'm sure many, many of you have felt this. And, and, but, but actually, how healthy, really, for our practice to not think that that's sort of some ultimate destination and will we can just rest there. No, no, not at all. We we come back to this, you know, this troubled human being that we are, you know, hopefully slowly getting less troubled and then things come and knock us back. And, and then we, you know, maybe we, we, we cope a little better each time or, or not, you know, but we just sort of pick ourselves up and come back to practice, come back to that first rut. So it's, it's a, it's a beautiful thing actually to start to develop a sense of being um well the cart <laughs> you know i am the cart that's trundling down 
this double track with its two wheels or four wheels, whatever it is, but on the two ruts, I'm not, I don't have to think it's all about getting to one or it's all about the other. It's both. It's very lovely to ride on both wheel ruts, you know? And so, so when I hear that phrase, which I used earlier, Royal Road to Awakening, it sort of somehow, is, I'm not sure really. As I'd like to say it's the royal road of both awakening and being a fallible, in the words of uh, one therapist I went to long ago, Albert Ellis, he said, we're all FFHBs, fallible, fucked up human beings. So we're, we're you know, the cart is both. Is Yeah, maybe it's got this cosmic wholeness to it, but it's also got this, you know, fallible, wounded, erring human that must stay open to vulnerability and woundedness and, you know, and, and being messed up and getting it wrong and again and again stumbling and again and again getting hurt and reactive and, and recovering, you know. There's that at the, at the same time as perhaps being part of a great wholeness that connects us intimately with all reaches of the cosmos and still being, you know, sometimes miserable, sometimes, you know, not so nice, sometimes, you know, reactive, defensive, and all the human foibles, you know, somehow being both, I think is, is um, just good, healthy, wholesome, happy. <laughs> it's a really good place to be. And, and, um, and so I'm, I'm advocating for this, um, Basically, in a lot of the teaching I'm doing these days, I'm advocating for the, the double track of healing and awakening. Because we don't want to deny that also, even while being the messed up person that I still can be, also somehow, yeah, like all of us, part of the great wide ocean of existence. And when and where, here and now, you know, right now, each of us is, is, a, is, is an inseparability. Each of us is, a, is an infinite presence, each of us. And also each of us has their struggles and foibles and, you know, things we're working on. And, and it's just beautiful. The real beauty of it is in being both and not thinking I, I gotta be one, you know, or I'm only the other, is the embrace of both, the openness to both sides of our humanness. That's what I'm loving, when it's all porous, and, you know, the, 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 the wound flows into the boundlessness, and the boundlessness flows back into the wound, and, and, the, and the defensiveness that can make things so difficult, you know, also Ah, it can open into the boundlessness. It also, it too somehow partakes of boundlessness. And, and the boundlessness is happy to show up as a, as a nasty, sharp little hurt in the side or something that is really uncomfortable. Is that, it's all doing all of it, you know? So I don't know. I don't know if this is making any sense. <laughs> but I want to read something now to you. Okay, so... Um, hoping that, that, that some of this is kind of making a kind of sense, you know, <laughs> just hoping. Um, um, here's what I'm going to read. It's a, it's a part of a, a beautiful uh, book that um, kind of little known book, actually, um, uh, that is um, by um, a... Uh, um, uh, um, a Japanese woman called Noriko Morishita, who went through a long, arduous training in the art of tea. You, you, some of you will know about Japanese tea ceremony. It's very sort of formal and um, highly disciplined and very sort of structured way of creating a nice cup of tea. You know, I'm sure you, you, some of you, for sure, I imagine we'll know about it. Um, and she she was going through this long training, finding it really difficult and very challenging. She hated, you know, the 
incredible, you know, what sort of seemed like fussiness of her sensei, her teacher, and scolding her for just having one finger a quarter of an inch in the wrong place and, you know, this sort of thing. And, um, and then one day, through all the, the discipline and training she's been led through just in this very precise art of serving tea, um, this thing happened to her that I'm going to read. And I see it as a, a moment of her discovering the second rut of the cart track and becoming a whole cart, and knowing she's the whole cart with both ruts under her. It's a day when she's sort of, she's come to the special tea house where she's being trained, and it's a very rainy day. So I'm gonna start reading at a certain point. All at once, the deluge intensified. It felt as if Sensei's house was under a waterfall. In fact, it was rather frightening. With the shutters on the southerly side closed, but the rest open, the tea room was enveloped in a gloomy, peculiar atmosphere. I felt quite helpless in the face of that overwhelming noise. It reminded me of nights when a typhoon was raging outside. Despite my anxiety, it was oddly thrilling, and I suddenly felt a closer connection to everyone around me. The rain pounded the roof and windows, all but drowning out every other sound within the wooden house. The downpour was so loud that I could visualize it as clearly as if I could actually see the scene outside vapor spraying up from the black tiled roof like white steam, muddy water splattering as it surged through the spouting. All the foliage in the garden left bedraggled by the cloudburst. Water cascading onto the eaves from the roof with a rat tat tat, giant puddles with surfaces churning so hard in the rain that they looked like fish scales, cars throwing up spray as they drove along the road, its asphalt surface transformed into a river, the whole garden wild with joy as the torrential rain washed over each and every leaf. I felt as if I could hear every single raindrop it was something like listening to music when you can identify each instrument from its timbre, bass drum, timpani, marimba, maracas. And it was interwoven with similar clusters of sound from further away, forming a magnificent multi-layered symphony of rain. Never before had I listened so intently to the rain. I felt as though I was plunging into a jungle of torrential noise. My heart pounded. It was raw and terrifying, but I wanted to keep going even deeper. I was nothing but a pair of ears. My hearing seemed to suddenly sharpen as I pushed past some kind of barrier. Huh? For a moment, my ears felt as though they were blocked. All at once, I was in a huge open space where silence reigned. Where was I? Nothing stood in my way. The strain of trying to not get the T procedure wrong, my ever-present work worries, the chores waiting for me at home that day. It was all irrelevant. The nagging worry that I needed to make more effort, the anxiety that I might be worthless without approval from others, the fear of my weaknesses being exposed, it all vanished. 
I was incredibly free. I felt as if large, tepid raindrops were pelting down, stinging my skin. It was like I was squealing with childish delight as the downpour washed over me so powerfully that I could not open my eyes. I had never known such freedom before. My horizons stretched out forever. I had always been here. There was no need to go anywhere else. Nothing was forbidden. Nothing was compelled. Nothing was lacking. Just being was satisfaction itself. Another squall of driving rain dispelled the sensation. My ears seemed to unblock and I was back in the room, sitting just where I had been. The experience could only have been seconds long, certainly less than a minute. Then, recalling that I had not yet looked at the Tokonoma scroll that day, I glanced behind me. I had to twist my body round and look up to see the short scroll. Written on it were two large characters. Chō u. Oh, listen to the rain. I could not tear my eyes away. Surrounded by the din of the lashing cloudburst, I felt as though I had been through a decisive moment. It was as if a locked door had opened in response to a magic word. In fact, I'd seen this scroll before, but I thought the sensei had chosen a scroll about rain because it was raining. I'd merely regarded the characters as symbols to be decoded. Now they seem to speak to me. When it's raining, listen. You've got to be right here in body and mind. You five senses and immerse yourself in savoring the now. If you do that, you'll understand. The path to freedom is always here, now. We torment ourselves with regrets about the past and worries about a future yet to come. But we can never go back to bygone days or prepare ourselves in anticipation of things to come, no matter how much we fret. We cannot feel at ease in our lives as long as we're thinking about the past or the future. There is only one path to savor the now. Only when we forget about past and future and immerse ourselves in the moment do we realize that we are living in complete freedom with nothing to stand in our way. Huh. And you know, <laughs> I mean, I don't think there's anything actually like practice to help us do exactly that. You know, again and again in, in meditation, we, you know, we realize we've been caught up in thinking, in scenarios. And, you know, the, the guidance, the instruction, the, the teaching so clear, you know, note it, maybe label it. I like using memories, plans, fantasies, just that little three folders, memories, plans, fantasies. They hit pretty much everywhere I go, you know, and when, when I do go away, it's always one of those three, I, I find. So I like using them in my mind. I just note, ah. Fantasies again. Oh, planning. I personally, very commonly, I go to planning. A kind of fraught, worried planning is a common place I go to. So just to note it, just to say it to myself, ah, planning, you know, really helps me. And then coming back, coming back. And, you know, the instruction is just keep, 
keep coming back. And gradually, we don't know it, actually. I don't think, I mean, I don't know it, I don't realize it, but actually every time we come back, you know, it may, it may feel like a drag, it may feel like not much is happening, and it, it may not be really, but actually over time, we're, 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 we're just, it's a little tap on some kind of barrier between us and the moment at hand. And, and, you know, from time to time, we'll just get a little piercing of the barrier, a little puncture, a little perforation, a little porousness. And we just, huh, just a little sense of, wow, not so sure that outside is outside. And the inside is inside. More of a sense of somehow being more merged, of barrier, border, boundary dissolving. You know, it, it just happens by itself. And maybe practice, in the way we're taught, is, 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 is one of the most effective ways to occupy our, our, our home here and now, ever more fully, thoroughly, and whole, wholly, and be the, the happy little cart on the two-rut track. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. Okay, um, I'm going to hit pause and hope that um, some of this has, has, has been some help. And let's see, we could, I'm going to, uh, there's a lot of chat messages I'm going to do and just take a quick look but let's see anybody like to um, ask something yes I see there's a hand up um, I'm going to have to I'm going to save the chat and look through it later oh I love that the goal of meditation is meditation <laughs> awesome yeah I can't wait to read all this um, but I don't think there's I'm going to so yes please Lubko uh, Hi, Henry. Uh, my question is, if uh, this taste of uh, unity is so um, inspiring and so important, I wonder if it would be useful for some people to achieve that taste through, I don't know, plant medicine or, um, you know, some other means. Yes. Hey, thanks for, for the question. Lovely question. Um, <clears throat> I, I really think that might well be the case. I mean, I think the, the renewed research into plant medicine and its potentials for human healing is one of the most important things going on at the moment. And I really am a, um, you know, personally, I mean, it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter what my personal story around it doesn't matter very much. I've done very little plant medicine myself but have had some experience that has been tremendously helpful uh, in, in a therapeutic way I, I feel that the real uh, the, 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 what I'm really excited about these days is that I think the confluence of plant medicine and meditation is going to be the golden ticket um, because um, I mean some may not need the plant medicine of course but but some may may well and and but I think that plant medicine combined with meditation is is just spectacular and I mean, of course I'm not the only person saying that I listened recently to a most amazing conversation with um, Roland Griffith you know who who's uh, one of the uh, better known uh, researchers in that field I think he's at Johns Hopkins and and he's um he was talking very openly about facing um, a terminal diagnosis that he has now. And he's, um, man, he, he, he did one, I think he did one, uh, one sort of trip, you know, one journey at some point after getting his diagnosis. And he's a very committed meditator. And it just sort of gave him some little lift to his meditation. And it's, it's awesome listening to him. Um, talk about his he's never been happier he's never been more open-hearted he's never been he's never lived more beautifully than since getting his diagnosis and i think and acknowledging that that plant medicine 
was an important element in that. Rachel, would you like to unmute and, oh, uh, George, can we unmute Rachel? Here I am. Hi. Hi, hi. I was, um, yeah, thank you so much. I, uh, I really appreciated everything you said tonight. And um, since you're talking about whole food plant-based, I've been doing that for eight years. And I tell you, it is a huge, calming, uh, wonderful feeling in the body. So um, I love being plant-based. And um, so anyway, since you mentioned that, but um, I had this experience. It's not really a question, but it kind of goes with what you were saying. And I just wondered if you had a comment. So I've been going to Qigong for about 15 years. I have the same teacher. I love her. And we would do these mirror images same, you know, she would mirror me and when we were doing Qigong. And I felt like we had emerged together in this odd way. And after the class, I said, did you feel that? Did you feel like you had emerged with me? And she said, yes. And so that's the only experience I have that you're, I can relate to with what you're talking about. But I don't know um, if you have a comment, I would like to hear it. <laughs> <Thank> <laughs> Well, yeah, how, how wonderful. I mean, I would, I suppose I might ask like, well, you know, just what, 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 what did it leave you with? Did it, it, it sounded, so you, you suddenly had a sense that what there was a, some kind of level on which you and the teacher of Qigong weren't separate kind of thing, something yeah, like that. Something yeah. like that. Yeah. Just, I just felt really a deep connection on a different level that I'd never felt anywhere before or after and, you know, she's always talking about we're one and, you know, all that Qigong talk. But it really, I really had a sense of that uh, just for that, that moment, you know, with her. And so um, anyway, that, that's my yeah. only experience. Well, I think that's very, very beautiful. And thank you for sharing that. And, you know, I, I, would, I would just um, encourage you to just, you know, be grateful for that. Yes. It sounds like you are, you know, how lovely. I was how lovely. Curious. It was just extraordinary because she had talked the talk all those years and then I felt it, you know, in my body. So yes. Yes, you see, it's thanks. And it's 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 kind of different. It's one thing to have an idea about it, and it's a really different thing to actually experience mm -hmm. it, isn't it? It's mm -hmm. it is a it is a what well, was wonderful. How thank you for sharing that very much. Yeah. Oh yeah. Well, thank you for uh, talking about all this stuff. Okay, have a nice evening. <laughs> Yeah, you too. Okay, maybe maybe we'll just do one more. Um, Lynn. There we go. Can you hear me? Yeah, got gotcha. <laughs> you. Um, I'm in I'm in Calgary. Let's see, what does it say here? Um, and thank you for your gentle guidance tonight. I that was just really lovely. Um, I had an experience. Oh, geez, it's been more than thirty years ago. And I didn't know what was happening. And eventually I discovered it was something called a Kundalini awakening. So is that a little bit of what you're talking about? It, 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 Just, it very, it very well might be. Yes. And it was, it was traumatic, but yeah, it was, it was, so it, it was, it was shocking and hard to assimilate and integrate. Was it? It happened as a result of I'd been doing some work on family stuff and it seemed like there was just one piece that hadn't been uncovered. So I went to a hypnotist and that set it off. Um, and was it helpful and, or was it just difficult? You know, in the long run, I think it was helpful. But at that time, it was just so just the searing through my spine and um clearing and the agony of that um right. but but what where it's left me is i always talk about sort of living in two worlds because the outcome of it was about a year into it was that i was able to talk to the other side hmm. um and i don't know what the medium or whatever the word is Wow. I, I can do it, but I don't because I have enough trouble just handling what I've got here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, yeah. but I do have guides that I talk to and they're with me all the time. I don't have to go into a trance or anything. I can just ask them and they're wow. kind and 
gracious and wonderful. Um, ah, how lovely. Well, I would, yeah. Um, it sounds like you're very open to them and receiving their help. So that's wonderful. Um, well, they're just part of my life. And I, I, it doesn't matter where I am or, but, but the one thing you were asking someone else, like what, what is, what has been sort of the um, outcome of this? Has it, and it's been a gradual sort of realizing that all someone has to do is, pardon me, talk about the cosmos. And I, I just find it so, it's wonderful. I don't even know how to say it. Oh. And that's my link. I I just, mm. I guess it's the word awe. Oh, yes. Yeah. You know, there's yes. like what oh. is, and, it, yeah. and so here, here is one expression of it. <laughs> my, my children have been tasked. I love taking a noun and making it into a verb like that. Mm -hmm. <laughs> have been tasked with figuring out how to put my ashes when I go, I'm not ready to go yet, on um, a magpie. <laughs> because that's where I want to go. <laughs> they can go closer to that place than I can. So they're working on it. Ah, how and, wonderful. And yeah. This balcony that comes by my bedroom window here in this apartment where I am, I'm just coming back from COVID, so I've spent quite a bit of time looking at the balcony. Yeah. Um, these these magpies come and they kind of look in my window, you know, and I go, not yet, guys. Next. Not yet. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, so I guess my question is, the Kundalini is uh, maybe possibly what you're talking about. It, it could be related. Yes, I, I just don't exactly know. But it sounds like um, the what what you're really something's opened up for you. And you and you have uh, when you were talking about the, you know, the effect of hearing about the cosmos. I mean, I, I feel that there's a, and the awe of that, that the, yes, indeed, there's a side of what we can sort of find really where it's just a great mystery. You know, yes. Oh, yes. Mystery. That's there's it. A, there's a there's a there's actually a saying and you know the phrase the the magnum mysterium you know yes. it's from and the, the great mystery and i think we 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 come closer to that on that second rut of the cart track where, where there's a great great mystery we never really know it we're giving up our knowing and surrendering and it shows itself and it's very very beautiful 